Welcome. I am doing EBRE number 13. This is going to be covering part of a salt, an intentional tort. Uh, I found this image and I thought I'd share it. Over here you see this man assaulting this female maiden. He's grabbing her from behind and threatening to kiss her. He hasn't quite kissed her yet, but he's threatening to. She's spilling her milk. Actually, that's probably battery. I don't know. I just thought I was trying to find something that was showing a reasonable apprehension of harm. So let's go over intentional torts anyhow. anyhow. Uh, these geese are assaulting this cat and frightening the cat. Okay, that's... Anyway, so um this is an expansion of emerson's video as i just said and i will put the link to that below the video is on a salt now let's go over intentional torts quickly now intent can be shown either through purpose to bring about an act or knowledge with substantial certainty excuse me <clears throat> to bring about an act now, uh, for assault, the intentional causing of imminent, unwanted, harmful, or offensive contact of another without consent or privilege. That's one way to describe it. Now, for a prima facie case, an intentional act by a defendant to cause apprehension of an immediate... Is that spelled right? It doesn't look right. Immediate, harmful, or offensive touching. Immediate or imminent, either word you could use, um, of offensive touching that offends a reasonable purpose, person's sense of dignity. The apprehension and causation. So if you break it apart, there's four elements, and the fifth damages is not required. And I'm going to read to you a seminal case, not the whole thing, from 1845, the first case, the earliest one I could find in the case book. Okay, it may be a brief synopsis. So consent is not a def excuse me, consent is a defense. An example uh, I'm going to give you is a close family member says to you, I'm going to give you a hug and a kiss. And you say, okay. Okay is consent. Right? So that's not an assault. So the defense, if someone accuses you of assaulting, you can say, well, they consented. Okay, so, so what, what is consensual, what might be perceived to a reasonable person as a threat or apprehensive of unwanted touching that turns into wanted touching anticipation? So anyway, Context is very important, and this is why sometimes it can be confusing. Now, words alone are not sufficient. Key point. Okay, now I'm going to just go over part of these. Now, if you look at Emerson, he breaks this apart. Now, you can look at intentional act. He says there's two parts. Uh, you have to have actual and proximate cause. That's causation. Words alone no, if you just have words and you, you don't have anything that's showing you that something's really going to happen, that's not sufficient. And it has to be Im imminent. Conditional words, I'll get into that in a minute, and threat of unreasonable force. Okay, so you have the intentional act or words and act. But both of them have act with it, right? Now, intent to cause. Now, substantial certainty. Here's some key words. Highly probable. Insane, there's a minority and no defenses. And then there's transferred intent. <clears throat> now, he talks about uh, different references, Prosser, Restatement Second, and some outlines. But if you look at apprehension of harmful or offensive touching, um, and then you have to appear to have the means for the causation. Okay, so let's jump over here real quick. And we just went over that, so let's jump over to two. There does not have to be actual physical harm or battery to recover damages. 
Now we're going to go over something that happened during the time when men owned their wives and women didn't have rights as much. They were like, uh, the two become one was the theory anyway, and one is going to rule and it's the man. Back in the 1300s. So basically, uh, a man was a tavern owner and his wife was inside too. The name of the case is uh, from Assisi's YBS Folio 99, Plactum 60. So that's where it's located. I believe this is in France. I don't know where it is. Um, it could be Latin. Uh, English back in the 1300s was a lot different. Maybe it's Old English. But it's um, I de S. This S should be higher. Hang on. E U V W D S 1345. Now, some of these concepts are international. Okay? If you think about the United States of America and United States of America law, the United States American law is based on European type laws that were developed by judicial authorities in European countries. And the colonies, when the first 13 colonies came, there was France, England, uh, Spain as different colonies in the United States. And so some of the laws kind of overlap and these really old laws are foundational it's what are the laws built on. So let's get to this assault case. Get back to assault. I'm just kind of elaborating here. So it's the earliest one I could find, and it's in Prosser. And the uh, wife was t very frightened, terrified. This man, the tavern was closed. He wanted to get in and buy some wine. And they're closed. It, it's past it's close okay and he's slamming a hatchet into the door I'm gonna read you a snippet off of the uh, source where I got this from and I put the source did I put it up there or below it's from the Prosser case book okay I put the page number and everything up there if you want to go back and w watch this again you can okay so said M D S and beat her and W pleaded not guilty. And it was found by the verdict of inquest that the said W came at night to the house of the said I and sought to buy of his wine. But the door of the tavern was shut, and he beat upon the door with a hatchet, which he had in his hand. And the wife of the plaintiff See, the husband's bringing this suit uh, for this trespass, and he wants damages for his wife being frightened. He put her, she put her head out the window, the wife put her head out the window, and commanded him to stop. And he saw, and he struck with the hatchet, but did not hit the woman. So he took the ha hatchet, he's threatening her with it. But he, he's not actually hitting her. He's hitting the door. Whereupon the inquest said that it seemed to them that there was no trespass. So this is like a, an appeal case, right? So the judge, Thorpe, says there is a harm done and a trespass for which he shall recover damages since he made an assault upon the woman. As has been found, although he did no other harm. Wherefore, tax the damages, and they tax the damages at a half a mark. Thorpe awarded that they should recover their damages, and that the others should be taken. And so note that for an assault, a man shall recover damages. The reason they're saying... <coughs> <coughs> saying that, excuse me, oh my gosh, I hope I don't need my inhaler. Okay, so, excuse me. Um, okay, so two states of mind are required, intention to act, communication of the act, the intent to cause the act with substantial certainty. Now, 
I made this little graphic here to, to kind of help you get the idea across. Now, if you break apart, you can see it's causing her apprehension. Okay? And I'm not going to get into the politics of when women uh, didn't have that many rights, but I'm just telling you that's the reason the man's recovering for her distress. Because it's, it, it was thought back then that if she's distressed, he's distressed. And you probably heard that saying, if mama ain't happy, nobody ain't happy or something like that. So the spouse were, and the husband and wife were considered one. And like I said earlier, the man, this is just old laws. Okay, plaintiff must have a concurrence with the act, words, or gestures that were communicated to the plaintiff to be in reasonable apprehension, worry, fear, trepidation of an imminent, unwanted, or offensive touching. Now, I just paraphrased what I read, but I underlined key points that are repeated in all sorts of other books. When you look at the different uh, authorities on this, you're going to see key words that keep popping up. Imminent is typically what they use for immediate. Okay, that's the term they classically use. Uh, so anyway, words alone are insufficient. Key point. You got, the defendant must reasonably have the ability or means to carry out this act immediately. Now, I'm not going to get into conditional threats that much, but I'll just go over it briefly. And then I'm going to show you um, a, uh, a real California bar uh, question. You can pause it and then practice it if you want <clears throat> after this. Okay, so conditional threats. Expression of a condition for the threat or battery to occur. It is a warning or expression of words that is prefaced with if or or. Now, the reason I'm, I, this is all paraphrased from what I read up on. And I use Gilbert's, I use several different books, uh, including Prosser, oh, it's Wade and Schwartz. So examples follow on how to distinguish real serious conditional threats and sarcastic or facetious conditional threats. When words that contradict the carrying out of this act, an example is a person holding up their fist at you and they're saying, uh, as if to swing, they're saying, if I could get away with it and if you weren't my partner, I would lay into you, lay it on you. And so basically they're making a conditional threat, meaning that they're not going to hit you, but if, if, if the conditions were right, maybe they would. Another example is somebody saying, let me at him, let me at him. Now, the person's really far away, and somebody's complaining about somebody that was hurting them. Now, when this is said, you're taking it as, okay, they're sympathizing with me. They're kind of joking around. They're saying, I want to get back at you. It's not assault, okay? So some conditional threats are assault, and some conditional threats are not assault. Some people get confused about that. That's why I'm giving you some examples of the different types of conditional threats. So another one of them is, um, so with the conditional threats, you think about it contextually, and it has to have apparent ability in it for the conditional threat to be assault. So let's say you have a robber. I, use, I thought of this one. He's got a weapon. He's... Uh, going over, he's putting his hand toward the gun, he's got it, and he says, move over, or I'm going to shoot. Okay, so this is a conditional threat of unreasonable force, and this would be assault, right? So you have uh, a condition. They're saying there's this condition. The condition is, if you weren't my spouse, I would... But since you are, but I'm really upset, or, you know, so context, you've got to interpret these. Now, it can't be a future harm. You can't say, uh, I'm going to, next year, next week, uh, tomorrow. It's got to be imminent. It has to be right now, okay? Immediate apprehension. 
Okay, so you might get upset and worried about something. Um, so some of this is uh, cut from uh, some other... I basically, when I'm making these, I take the beginning of part of, like, all the intentionals or all the negligence, and I cut and paste part of it into a new document and try to break it apart because it's too much to put in one document. So I started with the guilt, the intentional torts, and I talked about a prima facie case. This is the same thing. Um, so you can you can pause this and you can take any one of these and then adopt whichever one you want. And so again, assault is the intentional causing of imminent harmful or offensive contact of another without consent or privilege. Now we need to really go over the uh, defenses. So we already went over battery. That's in number 12. And there are things called transferred intent and so on and so forth. So what I want to do is I want to quickly read this juicy July 1993 question. And this is going to be the end. You could stop right now. You don't have to watch the whole thing. But this is like a practice question. If anybody wants to post timestamps below on the segments, that would be nice. Because somebody might want to come back and just jump to... The July 1993, if I have time, I might put them in myself. But anyway, so this is a question that's involving a lot of different uh, torts questions, okay? So here, I'm going to read it to you, and then I'm going to come back, and I'm going to give you, uh, break this apart, and give you uh, segments of what should be in it. I'm not going to actually write an answer, because I don't have the answer. I don't have the model answer from the bar. But I did get the 2010 uh, July one, which I'm going to talk about uh, in another one, because uh, I didn't fully go over all the segments of intent. Emerson has a section there for 10 minutes, uh, and then he goes over various prior bar questions. So either way, I'll put the link to Emerson below as well and the two playlists on the torts. So Diana, age 16, lives at home. By the way, this this is July 1993. Uh, uh, I had to kind of like search for this. But anyway, she lives at home with her mother, Mary, in a state where the age of majority is 18. Okay. So she's considered an adult at 18. Mary's aware that Dinah has recently exhibited sometimes violent and delusionary nature diagnosed as schizophrenia and has attacked persons in the neighborhood. Medication can control Diana's behavior that's been prescribed, but without Mary's knowledge, Diana has stopped taking it. Okay. Um... Okay, does it say... Oh, Diana is age 16. Okay, so the age of consent is 18. And Diana is 16. I'm just highlighting these points because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back later and I'm going to tell you my analysis of this. Okay, but anyway, so... Uh, medication can control her behavior, uh, and Mary didn't know it, but she stopped taking it. A week after Diana stopped taking the medication, she approached a neighbor, Paul, as he was walking along the sidewalk, fronting Mary's home. When she was face to face with Paul, Diana, without provocation, gestured threateningly and screamed. I know you're out to get me, and I'm going to get you first. And then she strode away. <laughs> Paul had no knowledge of Diana's mental illness. Phoned Mary about the incident. Mary told Paul, Diana has sometimes made threats to others, but I don't think she will try to hurt you. And I assure you, this will not happen again. Paul believed Mary's assurances for that reason and did not seek to avoid Diana. 
Mary questioned Diana about the incident, scolded her, and asked if Diana was taking her medication. When Diana said she was, Mary didn't pursue the matter. Two days after Diana confronted Paul, Diana saw him raking leaves which had fallen into the street fronting their adjoining homes. Diana got on her bicycle and rode it as rapidly as she could directly at Paul. Although Diana swerved away from Paul at the last moment, Paul reacted by diving to one side. He struck his head on the curb and suffered a severe concussion with facial injuries. Paul has sued Diana and Mary for alleging torturous causes of action. Is Paul entitled to recover against Diana for assault? Discuss. Battery. Discuss. Is Paul entitled to recover against Mary on the ground that Mary was negligent as to Paul? Discuss. On the ground that Mary is vicariously liable for Diana's conduct. So right here in this fact pattern, you can see that they're already giving you some of the issues that might be in the uh, uh, fact pattern and um, vicarious liability, right? For the behavior of another, she's 16, um, the state is 18, she does have an illness, uh, but if she takes her medication, she's fine. Okay, um, that's going to be it for today. If you can get your hands on or want to do a practice question, that's fine. On the next EBR, I'm going to come uh, and expand on assault, and I'm going to give you a, a breakdown. I'm going to expand this answer um, and kind of break it apart and talk about it. Another thing I want to do is I found that the California 2010, uh, July, question number one has one that includes uh, these, and it I have I have actually have the entire PDF. It's 90 pages of the whole bar from 2010. Is it July? Yeah, it's July. Let me write this in real quick. Okay, so thank you for coming by, and I shall continue as I can. But I think what I'm going to do is I might go over this and then do it the way Emerson did, where he does day one some of the contracts, day two some of the contracts, day one some of the, like he has three subjects on day one, and um, he starts with negligence, but he does an overview so anyway, um, guys, I want to thank you for listening, and if you uh, put your comments in the box below, I'd appreciate it. i love to hear from you. It helps the algorithm, and it's one way you can give back. Thank you for listening, and take care. Have a great rest of your day. Bye. Oh, shoot.